Now this is my area. Hi everyone, my name is Rebecca and welcome back to... Okay, I gotta take this thing off, it doesn't feel right. <laughs> Today I'm talking about Sherlock sexuality, because contrary to what you may have heard from some sources, Sherlock Holmes is a gay man. So I'm going to be explaining the evidence that Sherlock is gay, both in coding and in dialogue, or a lack of dialogue, as is the case in many places. But first, a quick reminder of something I said all the way back at the beginning of this series. We live in a society that teaches us that being straight is the norm the only norm, and that thinking that someone is gay, even when they give off every possible sign that they are, is rude or offensive somehow. But it isn't, and a lot opens up when you overcome that kind of thinking even though it can admittedly be difficult to do. The problem enters when a character exists only as a stereotype and is given no other development or personality. When a character is well developed and fleshed out, but also given some of those cultural indicators, interpreting those as the author is telling us that a character is gay is not offensive. They gave him those traits for a reason. So let's start with the title of the first episode. I've talked about this before, but it bears repeating here. The title of the first Sherlock Holmes story is A Study in Scarlet. Imagine it's a few years from now and everyone knows that BBC Sherlock was setting out to be the first explicitly gay adaptation of Sherlock Holmes. What better title could you ask for for a first episode than a study in pink? So as soon as Sherlock is introduced, we start getting gay coding. Molly asks Sherlock out, and he appears to not even pick up on her interest. Listen, I was wondering, maybe later, when you're finished... You're wearing lipstick. You weren't wearing lipstick before. I, uh... I refreshed it a bit. Sorry, you were saying? I was wondering if you'd like to have coffee. Black, two sugars, please, I'll be upstairs. That might be pointing to him being an oblivious asexual person, were it not combined with him giving her blunt fashion advice when she returns with his coffee. What happened to the lipstick? It wasn't working for me. Really? I thought it was a big improvement. Mouth's too small now. And winking at the cute army doctor Mike brought to meet him. The name's Sherlock Holmes and the address is 221B Baker Street. Mike says he's always like that. Yeah, he's always like that. The next day at Baker Street, Mrs. Hudson, the first character who knows Sherlock well, assumes that Sherlock wants to move in with John because they're dating, because she believes that he's gay. What do you think then, Dr. Watson? There's another bedroom upstairs if you've been needing two bedrooms. As I've pointed out before, of the numerous times that someone assumes that Sherlock is gay in front of him, he very blatantly never once corrects them. Of course we'll be needing two. Oh, don't worry, there's all sorts around here. Mrs. Turner next door's got married. Lestrade brings Sherlock a case, and his reaction is... lively. Brilliant! Yes! Ah, four serial suicides and now a note. Ah, oh, it's Christmas. Keep in mind that Sherlock Holmes was originally a character from the Victorian era, a time where gay people could literally be charged with indecency. Sherlock doesn't seem to care very much about being decent. There's no point sitting at home and there's finally something fun going on. Look at you all happy, it's not decent cares about decent. The game, Mrs. Hudson, is on. At the crime scene, Sherlock stops in his tracks both times John compliments him. It's brilliant. It's fantastic. Do you know you do that out loud? Sorry, I'll shut up. No, it's fine. He clearly appreciates being complimented. It's a callback to the original canon, where Watson quickly figured out that Holmes enjoyed being complimented on his deductions the same way a woman would enjoy being complimented on her looks, meaning these interactions are meant to be flirty. Sherlock proves once again that he's aware of fashion. No, she never got to the hotel. Look at her hair! She color coordinates her lipstick and her shoes. She'd never have left any hotel with her hair still looking... Gets all about the prospect of an exciting case. Serial killer's always hard wait for them to make a mistake. And leaves the crime scene shouting the word pink. PINK! It's already a lot to take in, and we aren't even halfway through the first episode. John's having to adjust to all of this, too. He gets kidnapped by Mycroft, Sherlock's own brother, who, like everyone else, assumes that a relationship between Sherlock and John is imminent. What is your connection to Sherlock Holmes? I don't have one. I barely know him. I met him yesterday. Mm, and since yesterday you've moved in with him and now you're solving crimes together. 
Might we expect a happy announcement by the end of the week? This is Mycroft talking, who knows Sherlock better than anyone. Why would he think John entering a relationship with Sherlock was likely if he didn't think his brother was gay? And just a few minutes later, Angelo also assumes that Sherlock called to his restaurant to make reservations for himself and another man because it's a date. And again, Sherlock does not correct him. Sherlock, anything on the menu, whatever you want, free, on the house for you and for your date. Do you want to eat? I'll get a candle for the table. It's more romantic. I'm not his date. You may as well eat the night on a It's not because he doesn't care what people think about his sexuality. He's quick to correct John when he asks if he has a girlfriend. You don't have a girlfriend then? Girlfriend? No, not really my area. A boyfriend, on the other hand. Do you have a boyfriend? Which is fine, by the way. I know it's fine. So you've got a boyfriend? No. He doesn't say, also not my area. He says, I know it's fine, because he's gay. Even when he's turning down John, he doesn't say he's not gay. He just says he's not looking for anything right now. John, um, I think you should know that I consider myself married to my work. And while I'm flattered by your no. interest, I'm really not looking for anything. No. He never once says boyfriends aren't his area or corrects anyone who thinks he's gay. But at multiple points, he goes out of his way to correct people who think he's interested in women. And unlike his obliviousness with Molly earlier, he instantly picks up on John's interest. Right. Okay. <laughs> You're unattached. Like me. Fine. <clears throat> Good. He lets John down easily here, but by the end of the episode, he's asking him out for dinner. That's how you get your kicks, isn't it? You risk your life to prove you're clever. Why would I do that? Because you're an idiot. Dinner. Starving. I could almost stop the video at this point, but we still have nine more episodes of evidence to get through. The way Sherlock looks at John at the start of The Blind Banker is already a lot for the first few minutes of an episode, especially if you read this scene as Sherlock deliberately winding up John, as I talked about in my video on The Blind Banker. You you had a row with a machine? Sort of. It sat there and I shouted abuse. Have you got cash? Take my card. Later in Van Coon's apartment, we get even more over-the-top gesturing. Requires quite a bit of contortion. And later, when he needs to get John to remember the numbers, his first instinct is to grab John's face with both of his hands and spin him around in a circle. Hey. Shut up, what are you John, doing? concentrate. I need you to concentrate. Close your eyes. No, what? Why? Why? What are you doing? I need you to maximize your visual memory. Try to picture what you saw. He proceeds to get a little bit embarrassed when John reveals he already took a picture of the code. The next day, when John informs Sherlock that he has a date with a co-worker, Sherlock very candidly tells him that he was asking him out. I need to get some air. We're going out tonight. Actually, I've uh, got a date. What? To where two people who like each other go out and have fun? That's what I was suggesting. John doesn't take this seriously, though, and by the end of the night ends up being kidnapped on his date. On the way to rescue John, Sherlock stares at the London Eye lit up with gay pride colors. Because, you know, that was super crucial to the suspense or something. Oh, and he gets really petty around Sarah. So this is what you do. You and John, you solve puzzles for a living. Consulting detective. What are these squiggles? The numbers. An ancient Chinese dialect. Oh, right, yeah, well, I, I, of course I should have known that. So these numbers, it's a cipher. Exactly. In The Great Game, Sherlock starts throwing a massive fit because he thinks that John isn't interested in him, and because he thinks that all the romantic nonsense on John's blog is just that. Nonsense. So you've written up the taxi driver case? Did you like it? Um, no. Why not? I thought you'd be flattered. Flattered. Sherlock sees through everything and everyone in seconds. What's incredible, though, is how spectacularly ignorant he is about some things. Now, hang on a minute. I didn't mean that in a... Oh, you meant spectacularly ignorant in a nice way. So we go around this sun and we went round the moon or round and round the garden like a teddy bear. It wouldn't make any difference. All that matters to me is the work. Without that, my brain rots. Put that in your blog. Or better still, stop inflicting your opinions on the world. Where are you going? Out. I need some air. Oh, sorry, love. Mrs. Hudson comes up and calls their fight a domestic, and as usual, Sherlock doesn't correct her. Instead, he goes to the window and sadly watches John walking away. You two had a little domestic? Oh, it's pulling me out there. He 
should have wrapped himself up a bit more. Going back to the way that Sherlock didn't pick up on Molly's interest in a study in pink, he instantly knows that Jim is gay and interested in him. Oh, sorry, I didn't... Jim! Hi! Come in, come in! <laughs> gay. Sorry, what? When Molly protests that Jim can't possibly be gay, this is what Sherlock says. He's not gay! Why'd you have to spoil? He's not. With that level of personal grooming? Because he puts a bit of product in his hair. I put product in my hair. What? People tend to pay more attention to the line about hair product, which, you know, is a great line considering that Sherlock has steadily been putting more and more product in his hair over the years. And by the looks of Setlock, John has started doing the same, but it's Sherlock's line that I want to pay attention to. Sherlock thinks that someone having a high level of personal grooming means they're gay, when he himself is one of the most fastidiously groomed people in the world. I need you to give this matter your full attention, Sherlock. Is that quite clear? What do you think of this shirt? You haven't moved. And Sherlock Holmes is described in the canon as having a certain quiet primness of dress, which the writers have said at multiple points they really wanted to carry across. But it's important to say, yeah. uh, there's a brilliant line in the original stories that although Sherlock Holmes uh, had a a uh, certain quiet primness of dress, which we've mm. also gone for. I mean, it's in, mm. in the original stories, it, all it really says is that he has a certain quiet primness of dress. Sherlock doesn't see any logical inconsistency there, because he's also well-groomed and stylish because he's gay. This episode also sees the first major use of rainbow lights to indicate Sherlock's visibly gay aura. Good. Um... Excellent. What else? Uh... Since I pulled out the Chronicles for the video on John's bisexuality, it's only fair that I do the same at least once here. In the Chronicles, there's a deleted portion of the scene where Sherlock first sees pictures of Irene. He turns the pictures to John to test them out on him, because he can't assess her attractiveness himself. Because he's gay. In the scene where Sherlock actually meets Irene, there are rainbows flying all over the place. And Sherlock avoids looking at Irene's body while he gives John's a thorough once-over. See, a man's body, he could read all day, but a woman's makes no sense to him. Even Irene picks up on it. She thinks John knows exactly where to look because he finds her attractive. Sherlock, on the other hand, she's not so sure about. Are you feeling exposed? I don't think John knows where to look. No, I think he knows exactly where. I'm not sure about you. And Sherlock says that he has no interest in looking at naked women. I want to look at naked women, I borrow John's laptop. You do borrow my laptop. I confiscate it. Sherlock very blatantly ignores all the advances of a woman showing every sign of wanting to sleep with him because he's not at all interested in her. You flirted with Sherlock Holmes. At him. He never replies. Now, Sherlock always replies to everything. He's Mr. Punchline. He will outlive God trying to have the last word. He also turns down Molly, although he makes an attempt to let her down gently. You always say such horrible things. <sighs> Every time. Always. Always. I am sorry. Forgive me. Merry Christmas, Molly Hooper. At that same Christmas party, he again gets petty with John's girlfriend. Oh, no, thank you, Sarah. Uh, no, 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 he's, he's not good with names. No, 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 I can get this. No, Sarah was the doctor, and then there was the one with the spots, and then the one with the nose, and then who was after the boring teacher? Nobody. Jeanette! Ah, process of elimination. John thinks Sherlock's behavior is ambiguous. Listen, has he ever had any kind of uh, girlfriend, boyfriend, a relationship ever? I don't know. How can we not know? But that's just because he doesn't understand that Sherlock has feelings for him. He's writing sad music. Doesn't eat. Barely 
talks. I need to correct the television. I'd say he was heartbroken, but, uh, well, he's Sherlock. He does all that anyway. In the scene where Sherlock is x-raying Irene's phone, Molly assumes that Sherlock is x-raying his girlfriend's phone. And Sherlock is incredulous at what straight people do in relationships. Is that a phone? It's a camera phone. And you're x-raying it? Yes, I am. Whose phone is it? A woman's. Your girlfriend? You think she's my girlfriend because I'm x-raying her possessions? When Sherlock meets Irene again, John gets extremely jealous and throws out a baby name idea. Hamish. John Hamish Watson, just if you were looking for baby names. And Sherlock looks deeply confused at the implication that he would sleep with her. When Irene tells Sherlock to impress her, he looks at John instead. Go on, impress a girl. There's a margin for error, but I'm pretty sure this is 7.47, leaving Heathrow tomorrow at 6.30 in the evening for Baltimore. Apparently it's gonna save the world. I'm not sure how that could be true, but give me a moment. I've only been the case for eight seconds. Even when Irene makes a very clear advance, he doesn't take her up on it. Instead, he asks why he would ever want to have dinner with her while taking her pulse to try to get a one-up on her. When I say had, I'm being indelicate. I don't understand. I'll be delicate then. Let's have dinner. Why? You might be hungry. I'm not. Good. Why would I want to have dinner? if I wasn't hungry. He does help her complete her scheme without meaning to, though, and Mycroft mistakenly assumes it's because he's in love with her. He apologizes because he never thought it was a possibility. I'm sorry. I didn't know. What he didn't know is that Sherlock could fall in love with Irene because he thought he was gay. Sherlock reinforces that he is. Don't be absurd. Even when the episode ends with Sherlock saving Irene's life, subverting the barrier gaze trope, there is still no indication that he's attracted to her and he calls her by her professional title as a show of respect, not by her name, which would be more intimate. The woman. In The Hound of Baskerville, Sherlock starts the episode extremely wound up and sexually frustrated. He's prancing around, rubbing at a giant upright harpoon. Nothing. Military coup in Uganda. Hmm. Hmm. Another photo of you with the. Uh... Oh. oh um. Cabinet reshuffle. Nothing of importance. Oh God! When John asks about cases, Sherlock responds with this. Ah, but there's more. Before Bluebell disappeared, it turned luminous, like a fairy, according to Little Kirsty. Yeah, totally necessary. That's to say nothing of the process of breaking into an army base and Sherlock's face when John pulls rank. It just doesn't happen. Ever heard of a spot check? Captain John Watson, Fifth Northumberland okay. Fusiliers. Sir, Major Barrymore won't be pleased, sir. He'll want to see you both. I'm afraid we won't have time for that. We'll need a full tour right away. Carry on. That's an order, Corporal. Yes, sir. Oh, and later, Sherlock's interest in fashion, which he himself associates with gay men, is reinforced again when the first thing he associates with the word liberty is liberty patterns. There's a huge focus on putting on a public front in the Reichenbach Fall, and a lot of that has to do with sexuality. The press are titillated at the idea that John and Sherlock might be in a relationship. Page five, column six, first sentence. Why is it always the hat photograph? Bachelor John Watson. What the hat is it anyway? Bachelor, what the hell are they implying? Is it a cat? Why's it got two fronts? It's a deer stalker, frequently seen in the company of you Bachelor stalk a deer with a hat. What are you gonna do, throw it? Confirmed bachelor, John Watson. Some sort of death frisbee. Okay, this is too much. We need to be more careful. Kitty later approaches Sherlock and explicitly asks about that relationship. And once again, Sherlock does not respond. No, I won't give you an interview. No, I don't want the money. You and John Watson, just platonic. Could I put you down for a no there as well? Kitty knows what that means and reinforces that there are a lot of rumors out there. There's all sorts of gossip in the press about you. But offers to set the record straight for him. Sooner or later, you're gonna need someone on your side. Someone to set the record straight. That offer makes Sherlock extremely angry because he's not interested in setting anything straight. You repel me. The front that Sherlock puts on isn't just for the public though. It's also for John, a fact that Molly very adeptly picks up on. You look sad when you think he can't see you. And he's been sadly staring at John for months. Oh, it's been me out there. He should have wrapped himself up a bit more.
had to. It was an experiment. An experiment? Shh. I was terrified, Sherlock. I was scared to death. Oh, the drug was in the sugars. I put the sugar in your coffee. Then I arranged everything with Major Barrymore. Nice touch, this. The pool where little Carl dies. Are you OK? <sighs> Me? Yeah, fine. I'm fine. Uh, of course I'll be fine. I am fine. I'm absolutely fine. Yeah. Somehow this is part of his scheme. You said I owe you. This is really gay. <laughs> then in The Empty Hearst, Sherlock's first idea of how he could reveal to John that he's alive is jumping out of a cake, which is pretty inherently sexual. I think I'll surprise John. He'll be delighted. You think so? Hmm, probably the Baker Street. Who knows? Jump out of a cake. He also rubs his lips, imagining how it will feel to kiss John with the mustache. Two thousand cent a million. Though I prefer the 2001. He goes to the restaurant with every intention of starting a relationship with John, only to see that he's about to propose to someone else. He desperately tries to interrupt, twice. Can I help you with anything, Sarah? Hi, yeah, I'm looking for a bottle of champagne. A good one? Mm. Oh, these are all excellent vintages. Uh, that's not really my area. What do you suggest? You're gonna possibly go home, but uh, maybe you'd like my personal recommendation. Mm -hmm. This last one on the list is a favorite of mine. Uh, it is, you might even say, uh, like a face from the past. Great. I'll have that one, please. It is familiar, but uh, with the quality of surprise. <sighs> well, uh, surprise me. Certainly endeavoring to, sir. So, I think you find this vintage exceptionally to your like in terms of the qualities of the art with uh, some of the color of the new. No, sorry, not now. Like please. a gaze from a crowd of strangers, suddenly one is aware of staring into the face of an old friend. Now look, seriously, could you just... When he finally gets John's attention, he makes sexually charged jokes. Yes, sir. Is yours rub off too? And he even blatantly tries to seduce him by the end of the night with his girlfriend standing right there. You have missed this. Admit it. The thrill of the chase, the blood pumping through your veins, just the two of us against the rest of the world. It doesn't work, but Sherlock continues to be his gay self. The next day, he gets up from his chair in the gayest way possible. I'm just passing the time. Can I get a freeze frame of that one? Yeah, once again, super necessary. Mm-hmm. Dramatic show. No gay. And we see Sherlock soften and acknowledge that he needs companionship, that he wants a relationship. What were they thinking of? Probably something about trying to make friends. Oh, yes. Friends. Of course, you go in for that sort of thing now. And you don't. Ever. Maybe he just doesn't mind being different. He doesn't necessarily have to be isolated. Exactly. I'm sorry? He's different, so what? Why would he mind? You're quite right. Why would anyone mind? He tries to solve crimes with Molly, but it doesn't go very well. You want to do something, aren't you? Maybe. Shut up. Shut up, John. Oh, sorry, did you want to fit? Uh, no, please be my guest. Yes. Shut up. Now, please, insult away. <sighs> Why would someone go to all that trouble? Why indeed, John? He makes an offhand comment about helping a man put up some shelves. The owner always gives me extra portions. Did you get him off and murder, George? No, nope, helps him put up some shelves. Which is a euphemism in England for having sex. I don't think he actually did, but he never jokes about having sex with women and always looks uncomfortable at the very idea. John does forgive Sherlock and even shaved off his mustache when he learns that Sherlock didn't like it. Sherlock says he's glad. So you shaved it off then? Yeah. Wasn't working for me. Yeah, I'm glad. Well, you didn't like it? I prefer my doctor's clean shaven. It's not the sentence you hear every day. As you can tell, that one even threw off John, who's usually totally oblivious to Sherlock's flirting, but they don't get anywhere with it, and John goes through with his engagement to Mary. The morning of the wedding, after Mrs. Hudson rubs in that things will never go back to the way they were when John was living with Sherlock, Sherlock sadly stares at John's empty chair. He also writes John a wedding song and practices dancing it alone, probably imagining dancing with John. Shut up, Mrs. Hudson. Janine, the maid of honor, quickly singles out Sherlock at the reception and casually jokes about not wanting to have sex. Sherlock looks horrified at the very idea. Famous Mr. Holmes. I'm very pleased to meet you. But no sex, okay? Sorry. 
You don't have to look so scared. I won't even ask it. Instead, he spends the entire reception making the gayest speech known to man and pointing out attractive men to Janine. That's the sort of thing you're looking for. The man over there in blue is your best bet. Recently divorced doctor with the ginger cat. A bone conversion in a history of erectile dysfunction. He's nice. Traces of two leading brands of deodorant, both advertised for their strength, suggestive of a chronic body odor problem manifesting under stress. Okay, done there. What about his friend? Long-term relationship, compulsive cheat. Seriously? Waterproof cover and a smartphone. Yet his complexion doesn't indicate outdoor work. Janine, what about this one? Acceptably hot? This is the same episode where he says he's unaware of the beautiful. But he knows what attractive men look like. In this speech, he also equates his love and devotion to John to Mary's. So know this, today you sit between the woman you have made your wife and the man you have saved. In short, the two people who love you most in all this world. Making it explicitly romantic. He also tells a room full of women that it's not them. Not you, 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 not you. Not you, 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 or you, or you, or not you, 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 not you. But later announces in front of an audience that it's always John. Narrow it down. No, 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 not you, not you. You. It's always you. John Watson, you keep me right. I don't know how much more blatant this can get. There's even more coding, though, like Sherlock differentiating between different shades of purple. Lilac. Lilac. And the Freudian slip of Sherlock saying all the nice girls like a soldier when he's talking to the soldier he's in love with. Uniform fetishist. All the nice girls like a soldier. He asks John if soldiers are given classes to resist the temptation to touch their butts. Because, you know, he finds the prospect tempting. You think they give them classes? Classes? How to resist the temptation to scratch their behinds. When John starts talking about Mary, Sherlock runs away into the army base, where he peeks into a rec room for no other reason than to check out the soldiers, and we get a lingering shot on them from Sherlock's point of view. <laughs> I haven't even gotten to the stag night yet. So in the lead up to the stag night, Sherlock goes to Molly to get her help. He asks about Tom out of courtesy, and Molly mentions having quite a lot of sex. Sherlock makes a similar freaked out face to the one he made with Janine earlier. And we're having quite a lot of sex. Instead of prolonging the discussion on straight sex, Sherlock shows Molly his ideal man. Okay. I want you to calculate John's ideal intake and mine to remain in the sweet spot the whole evening. Light-headed, good. Urinating in wardrobes, bad. He literally pasted John's head onto the Vitruvian man's body. When Molly sees this, the screen explodes in rainbows. Hmm. Yeah, that was pretty gay. But not as gay as drunken Sherlock. He becomes the human embodiment of a swish. I know Ash! Don't tell me I don't. When he's alone with John in Baker Street, he becomes unbelievably soft and flamboyant, alternating between being gentle with John. And I can't even remember what for. It's crime, something like that. Am I a woman? <laughs> yes. Buddy. Thank you. <laughs> Got it. I love you, aren't I? And doing sassy hand waves. Kind of sometimes. Mm. Nice. If people like me. I'm, I'm nice-ish, clever, important to some people, but I tend to rub them up the way. Am I the current king of England? Yeah, because asking if you were the current queen of England would have been too much. Like, that's where they draw the line. Sherlock even looks pleased when John touches his knee. You'll go. I don't mind. Am I? When they go to the Mayfly man's apartment, there's a lot of sexual imagery thrown at the audience very quickly. From Sherlock rimming a circular piece of glass. Oh, it's nice. 
to saying he's going to whip things out with even more swishing. I'm just gonna whip this out. He's a famous detective. To planting himself on the floor with his butt in the air. To finally being up on his knees, delicately dabbing fluid from his mouth. Yeah, they're definitely sexualizing him. In a gay way. And as a bonus, a few scenes later, we see Sherlock strutting around with an entire pack of cigarettes in his mouth. Yikes. After the case is solved, Sherlock confides in Janine that he loves dancing and does an actual pirouette. I bet you learned something, Janine. Go on, then. I love dancing. I've always loved it. Seriously? Watch out. <laughs> Since Sherlock loves dancing, you can imagine how conflicted he would have felt teaching John to dance for the wedding. This is the waltz, is it? No. <laughs> Don't worry, Mary, I have been tutoring him. You did, you know? Baker Street, behind closed curtains. Mrs. Hudson came in one time. Don't know how those rumors started. <laughs> Janine Riley remarks that she wishes that Sherlock weren't whatever he is gay, and he says he knows. John appears on screen as if summoned when Janine says, Whatever it is you are. I wish you weren't. Whatever it is you are. Because what he is, is in love with John. He eventually dates Janine, but that relationship is a total sham, showing once again that Sherlock has no real interest in women. Just look at the face he makes when Janine sits on his lap. But we should have you two over for dinner. John looks the other way when Janine leans in to kiss Sherlock, so he doesn't see how he literally makes no effort to kiss her back. Solve me a crime, Sherlock Holmes. He clarifies once again on the way up to Cam's office that women aren't his area. I imagine she'll want to stop seeing me at that point, but you're the expert on women. Janine also knew this the entire time. Just one thing. You shouldn't have lied to me. I know what kind of man you are, but we could have been friends. The kind of man he is, is a gay man. Now we get to all of the most convincing pieces of evidence, at least in my opinion. When Sherlock is shot by Mary, he's running through his mind palace trying to find something to calm him down. He's looking for John at first, but he runs into Mary instead, who shoots him in the chest while wearing a wedding dress. <laughs> because watching her marry John was just as painful as this is. Sherlock eventually locks himself in a cell with Moriarty, and Moriarty tells Sherlock to embrace the pain. Why did you never feel pain? You always feel it, Sherlock. But you don't have to fear it. Heartbreak. Heartbreak. He said heartbreak. Who could Sherlock possibly be heartbroken over if not John? But if that wasn't enough, thoughts of his heartbroken family or even the woman do nothing. You're gonna love being dead, Sherlock. No one ever bothers you. Oh, Mrs. Hudson will cry. And mommy and daddy will cry. And the woman will cry. But John's pain and the reminder that John needs him. Well, that changes everything. And John will cry buckets and buckets. It's him that I worry about the most. That wife. You're letting him down, Sherlock. John Watson is definitely in danger.
Sherlock literally restarts his heart because he's so in love with John. And he has been from the very start, even though he never got around to saying it. John, there's something I should say, uh, I've meant to say always and I never have. Since it's unlikely we'll ever meet again, I might as well say it now. He doesn't follow through with his confession, but it's very obvious that what he always wanted to say is that he's in love with John. And of course, when we go into Sherlock's mind palace again, things get gayer than ever. The dream starts with the image of John in uniform for no other reason other than that Sherlock is attracted to the fact that John is a soldier. <laughs> The Second Afghan War brought honors and promotion to many. But for me, it meant nothing but misfortune and disaster. And he looks John up and down when he meets him in the morgue. Excellent reflexes. You'll do. The conclusion seemed inescapable. All this while still clearly not being interested in women, not even wanting them in his house. Mrs. Hudson, there is a woman in my sitting room. Is it intentional? When explaining Mary's case, he talks about her situation like her husband has found another lover, when we all know the unsavory companion is him. You have recently married a man of a seemingly kindly disposition who has now abandoned you for an unsavory companion of dubious morals. He doesn't just like that John is a soldier, he likes that he's a doctor too. He fantasizes about John correcting his deductions. I, 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 I hope so. you have misdiagnosed. Then correct me, doctor. <sighs> like, this is just a lot all at once, you know? Things get even more explicit in the scene in the greenhouse. Sherlock imagines John bringing up a conversation about his sexuality again, with this delightful lead-in. You know, it's rare for us to sit together like this. I should hope so. It's murder on the knees. <laughs> Two old friends just talking, chewing the fan, man to man. He states again that he has no interest in women. Is a remarkable woman? Who? Lady Carmichael. The fair sex is your department, Watson. I'll take your word for it. He pretends to be totally unfeeling, but this John doesn't believe it. Why do you need to be alone? If you are referring to romantic entanglement, Watson, which I rather fear you are, as I have often explained before, all emotion is abhorrent to me. It is the grit in a sensitive instrument, the crack, crack in, in the, the lens. lens. Yes. Well, there you are, you see, I've said it all before. No, I wrote all that. You're quoting yourself from the Strand magazine. Well, exactly. No, those are my words, not Yours, that is the version of you that I present to the public. The brain without a heart, the calculating machine. I write all of that, Holmes, and the readers lap it up, but I do not believe it. Then John starts hounding him, insisting that he must have feelings, impulses, because he's flesh and blood. Damn it, Holmes, you are flesh and blood, you have feelings, you have, you must have impulses. Remember, this is all happening in Sherlock's head. He wants to have this conversation, to talk about his impulses with John, or rather to have John tell him that he already knows that he has them. The specific desires go unnamed because it's 1895, and they can't be explicit here, but it gets pretty close. John asks what made Sherlock the way he is, and Sherlock replies that he made himself. As your friend, as someone who worries about you, what made you like this? Oh, Watson. Nothing made me. I made me. Nothing happened to make Sherlock gay. It's the way he is. There are also multiple hints throughout the episode that rather than being unfeeling, Sherlock considers himself an overdramatic, sentimental mess. Pure reason toppled by sheer melodrama. Your life in a nutshell. Sorry, I could never resist the gong or a touch of the dramatic. Never have guessed. Is this silly enough for you yet? Gothic enough, mad enough, even for you. The setting's a shade melodramatic, don't you think? For you and me? Not at all. Bouncing off that last clip, let's talk about Moriarty. In this dream, Moriarty represents Sherlock's fears about his emotions and his sexuality. Moriarty's behavior towards Sherlock is undeniably sexual. It's a dangerous habit to finger loaded firearms in the pocket of one's dressing gown. Or are you just pleased to see me? I like your rooms. I smell. So manly. By the way, you have a surprisingly comfortable bed. Exactly. Let's stop playing. We don't need toys to kill each other. Where's the intimacy in that? Because all of his repressed feelings and desires are gay feelings. The scene crowns off with Moriarty getting on his knees and putting a loaded gun in his mouth. It's on the tip.
And this is the same guy who later says this. I am your weakness! Ugh. I keep you down! Every time you stumble, every time you fail, when you're weak, I am there! So Sherlock's weakness is that he's afraid to let himself be gay. Let's skip ahead to that waterfall scene, actually, because you all know I like talking about it. So Moriarty goes on about how he's Sherlock's weaknesses, and then tells Sherlock they're doomed to end up together. Shall we go over together? It has to be together, doesn't it? At the end, it's always just you! At me! This is a nightmare scenario that works on two levels, both with Sherlock being dragged down by his own fears and Sherlock being doomed to end with Moriarty. The solution Sherlock imagines is just as wonderful either way. Moriarty in this scene is all desperate shouting, but with just one quiet clearing of his throat, John swoops in to save Sherlock. It has to be together, doesn't it? At the end, it's always just you and me! <laughs> As if that weren't romantic enough, John explicitly says that he's saving Sherlock from unwanted advances. Professor, if you wouldn't mind stepping away from my friend, I do believe he finds your attention a shade annoying. Dream John tells Moriarty all of Sherlock's fears that he will always be there for Sherlock. That's not fair, there's two of you. There's always two of us. Don't you read the strand? Sherlock responds to this reassurance with a display of intimacy when he calls John by his first name for the first time in the episode. Thank you, John. John makes it a point that this is unusual for them, and Sherlock, with a slow, warm smile, says he'd be surprised at what was normal for them. Dream John smiles warmly back and says he wouldn't. Since when do you call me John? You'd be surprised. No, I wouldn't. John mentions that he knows that Sherlock is dreaming, and Sherlock's smile grows, and he continues to call John by his first name. Time you woke up, Sherlock. I'm a storyteller. I know when I'm in one. Of course. Of course you do, John. John asks what the real him is like, and Sherlock says he's smarter than he looks. So what's he like? The other me in the other place? Smarter than he looks. John's response, pretty damn smart, implies that John already looks smart, read handsome. So he must be even smarter. Sherlock, with a sly, warm smile, agrees, and they make the worst eye contact ever. Pretty damn smart, then. Pretty damn smart. When will someone just tell them that they need to get married? Ugh, why don't you two just elope, for God's sake? Oh, right. <laughs> They admonish Moriarty for intruding, and the transition to the next topic is left ambiguous, so it can be read as the two of them agreeing to get married. Actually, would you mind? Not at all. With his fears put to rest, Sherlock can finally wake up, and he can let himself fully fall in love, which is why he wakes up by diving off of the cliff. He has a huge smile on his face as he does, because he finally feels safe to love and desire John. <laughs> He'll survive the fall because John will be there to catch him when he lands. And then there's the last scene. Like I've said before, I think this scene is the only one in the episode that is actually a standalone from the rest of the series. It's not meant to be part of Sherlock's dream, but rather the original Holmes and Watson. Even this Holmes is thrilled to be spending time alone with Watson, and they are so warm towards each other. Have you written up your account of the case? Yes. Hmm. Modified to put it down as one of my rare failures, of course. Of course. Adventure of the Invisible Army. The League of Furies? The Monstrous Regiment. I rather thought the Abominable Bride. Trifle lurid. It'll sell. It's got proper murders in it, too. You're the expert. Watson scoffs at Holmes' imagined future, and Holmes admits he might have gotten a little carried away. Perhaps I was being a little fanciful. But perhaps such things could come to pass. Still, he thinks he would be more at home in his fantasy world. In any case, I know I would be very much at home in such a world. Watson doubts he would belong there, but Holmes says he would. Oh, I don't think I would be. I beg to differ. Because his imagined future represents a time when they can be free to be together without fear, openly for all the world to see. Holmes longs for that, and for that reason, and that reason alone, he's a man out of his time. But then I've always known I was a man out of his time. He dreamily looks out the window, and Baker Street transforms into the world of his dreams, the world of our show, where all of Holmes' gayest wishes can finally be realized.
The man is gay. I don't know what to say other than that. Sherlock has shown time and again that while he has no interest in women, he does have desires, and those desires are for men. Mostly for John, but that's only because we meet Sherlock after he's already met John. Even then, we get at least one instance where Sherlock shows attraction to other men, and the fact that everyone in his life assumes he's gay points in that direction as well. He is a gay man, and I am proud of him. So I didn't reference any metas for this episode, but I did make a post asking people to tell me their favorite gay Sherlock moments just so I didn't leave any out, and I'd like to thank everyone who contributed to that. So thank you to John Locke B, Pilgrim Child, Just Sort of Happened, Sine the Fangirl, Cluing for Looks, John Locke Queen 16, The Spiritual Multi-Nerd, Bag and Shield Hell, There Are No Ghosts, Sherlock Watson, Ang Kataras, Gwyndal, Ellen Tari, Unapologetic OCD Sufferer, Bisexual Watson, Prince Sherlock, Marzixum, Fancy Tuna, Captain Liddy, My John Locked Life, Lil Small Beans, and John Locke TM, who I knew I could count on because her last username was Gay Sherlock. I also referenced a few interviews which you can find sourced below. Oh, and huge thank you to Sherlock's cheekbone for designing a new outro for me. It was super sweet of you to make that. Sorry for the weird schedule the last few weeks. It should be adjusting back to normal now. Until then, thank you for watching and get ready to believe.